Hello and welcome to my class on hypokalemia. So today we will be talking about potassium and especially when potassium goes low because I have seen a lot of times in my critical care patients they they land up with hypokalemia during their stay or they may be admitted with hypokalemia. So um, we should be having a good idea of how to treat hypokalemia including how to calculate the deficit so total body potassium is about 50 milliequivalents per kg body weight so if somebody weighs around 60 kilos his total body potassium would be 3000 milliequivalents but we know that serum potassium is 3.5 to 5.5 milliequivalents per liter. So that means most of the potassium is inside the cell. Okay. So the relationship between between serum potassium and the total body potassium is sort of curvy linear. Okay. So that's serum potassium. And if this side is deficit and this side is gain so this relationship is almost on a flatter part of the curve now what does it mean it means that if potassium is going low if potassium is going low the serum potassium will not change much or if at all it changes it changes at a slower rate but if it is going up the serum potassium will change at a faster rate which is explainable now cell has got abundance of potassium so if it is going low in ECF then more potassium will come out so that way it actually maintains potassium so when do we call it hypokalemia now if serum potassium is less than 3.5 we call it hypokalemia and what are the causes of hypokalemia okay so potassium as we saw there may be transcellular shift or we may have a simple loss of potassium now loss of potassium can be through kidneys or extra renal now kidneys it may be diuretic induced or maybe a deficiency of magnesium which very frequently people tend to forget and extra renal a very good example is diarrhea coming to transcellular transcellular is most commonly seen in alkalosis or if somebody is on beta agonists this is also seen with insulin so these these conditions will result in in transcellular shift of potassium and potassium will go inside and you'll see uh, a drop in serum potassium okay so once we have we have known we have seen that this patient has got hypokalemia now how do you replace it now replacing is important before that we need to calculate the deficit what is the deficit of potassium okay so there is a simple rule uh, which approximates as a single unit drop in potassium from 3.5 will result in 10% drop in total body potassium okay so if somebody who, whose weight is around 60 kgs his total body potassium would be 3000 milli equivalents and if his potassium drops from 3.5 to 2.5 so that would mean single unit drop which would mean 10% drop in this which is 300 milli equivalents so this patient needs 300 milli equivalents of potassium to be replaced now for replacing what solution do you want to use so there are two types of solution most commonly used is potassium chloride which is KCL and sometimes potassium phosphate is also used but let's focus on potassium chloride because phosphate is usually used in um, 
diabetic ketoacidosis patients. So potassium chloride comes as a as an ampule of 10 ml with one or two milliequivalents of potassium per ml, having a concentration of around 10, 20, 30, or 40 milliequivalents. How do we give it? We don't have to give it through a peripheral vein because because of its irritant properties. Uh, but there is one exception to it. I'll come to that. We usually make a solution of two ampules of potassium chloride. So that would contain 40 milliequivalents, and this will be 20 mils. Add 20 ml of normal saline to it. That would be 40 milliequivalents in 40 ml normal saline so that's 1 milli equivalent per ml and then start it at 10 ml per hour through an infusion pump okay now if this this rate can go up you can go up to 20 and and people have used even a higher rate more than 20 but then if you are using a higher rate of more than 20 please there is a, there's a theoretical chance of if you are using a central line of a cardiac standstill the right side of heart may, may, may have a standstill because of potassium so if you are using a higher rate which which very rarely required then you may have to use a peripheral line rather than a central line so let us see one example like as we discussed earlier, if somebody's potassium has come down from 3.5 to 2.5 and the weight of the patient is 60 kgs, so his total body potassium is 3000 milliequivalents. And since this is dropped by 1%, see if, if it was 2, this would drop by 15% uh, of this. So this is one unit drop, which means 10% drop of total body potassium which means 300 milliequivalents draw total deficit now if you if you give the infusion at 10 milliequivalents per hour you will require 30 hours of infusion so potassium may take some time to you know start coming up because as we saw the as we saw in that graph this is curvilinear so you start giving potassium you will may you may not see an early rise in serum potassium because that's on the flatter part of the curve so this may take one or two days to come to completely uh, come to the normal limits and please remember the good old magnesium because magnesium acts as a coenzyme and it acts in reabsorbing potassium from kidneys so in refractory hypokalemia sometimes magnesium helps a lot so don't forget to give magnesium if the potassium is not getting corrected in spite of giving infusion okay so that's about hypokalemia and its management thank you for joining me join me for management of hyponatremia in next video thank you very much